Hello, everyone, and welcome to the eighth installment of the Yale Center for Environmental Law and Policies, Climate Change Solutions, Frontline Perspectives from Around the Globe webinar series. My name is Jonathan Smith, and I will be hosting the webinar today. The Center and our partners at World Resources Institute and the Environmental Defense Fund are very excited to welcome Mr. Nobuo Tanaka of the Institute of Energy Economics, Japan, for today's webinar. The Climate Change Solutions webinar series is designed to highlight climate policy developments in each of the 10 highest carbon emitting nations of the world. We hope that delving into the climate actions of each of these key nations will help share climate change solutions across the globe. Today, Mr. Tanaka will be focusing on the energy policy of Japan and Asia more broadly. Just a bit of logistics before we pass the microphone to Mr. Tanaka. Hopefully you can all hear me and have connected to the webinar by integrated VOIP under the communicate menu in your WebEx window. Uh, we are going to have a question and answer session in the last 10 or 15 minutes of the webinar. So please write down your questions into the chat panel on your right side of your screen during the presentation. We will compile them and ask them at the end. Feel free to include your name, affiliation, and or location when asking your questions. Uh, we would also like to note that Mr. Tanaka will be streaming video during the presentation, and this video should be streaming in the panel at the right side of your webinar window right now. Now, to introduce our speaker, uh, Mr. Nobuo Tanaka is currently the Global Associate for Energy Security and Sustainability at the Institute of Energy Economics Japan, a role he has occupied since September of 2011. From 2007 to 2011, he was Executive Director of the International Energy Agency. During his tenure, he was responsible for pioneering the concept of comprehensive energy security, while also expanding the agency's focus on climate change, renewable energy, and the transition to a low-carbon energy economy. Mr. Tanaka began his career in the Ministry of Economy, Trade, and Industry in Tokyo, and has also served as Minister for Industry, Trade, and Energy at the Embassy of Japan in the United States, and is both Deputy Director and Director for Science, Technology, and Industry at the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development. So without further ado, here is Mr. Tanaka. Thank you, Jonathan. Uh, good morning or good evening or, or, or good afternoon. I don't know where you are, but uh, thank you very much for inviting me to talk to all of you. As, um, as I was in introduced, uh, my career started with the uh, Japanese government, METI, Minister of Trade Industry. But uh, I experienced lots of the foreign uh, assignment in Washington, Paris. So I'm very often called as foreigner in Japan. But uh, now, uh, much more than ever, that uh, we need a kind of foreign view about the Japanese uh, energy policy or security policy or sustainability, sustainability policy because uh, really after tsunami and uh, Fukushima incidents, uh, we are now uh, reviewing our energy policy and global view is really imminent to be uh, input into the process. I use my uh, slides, which I often use in various places, and uh, certainly it touches upon the IEA's uh, document, International Energy Agency's documents uh, called the World Energy Outlook 2011, and uh, I try to give you some idea what uh, these uh, uh, findings mean for Japanese policy uh, making. I will start with the first uh, slide, and uh, you can see me with uh, Henry Kissinger. As uh, you know, you may know that, that he is the founding father of the IEA, International Energy Agency, in 1974, faced uh, with the threat of the oil producing countries embargo of oil to of the some of the countries. Uh, IEA was created to safeguard this uh, disruption of the oil supply by creating uh, a joint operation or joint release of strategic stockpile of oil. So IEA 
is the security or petroleum security body. And uh, we have used three times this uh, strategic stockpile release. Now, as you know, in the United States, there are discussion about using it again uh, when the high prices of oil is coming because of the Iranian uh, situation. But uh, certainly, this issue of energy security or petroleum security is now getting much bigger because after the first and second oil shock, Many countries are moving away from oil and uh, diversifying their sources into gas, coal, nuclear power, or renewable energy sources, or of course much more efficiency, energy efficiency or conservation. So in fact, energy security's focus should move a little away from petroleum. Still petroleum is a very important source, but uh, into the gas, into the renewables, or into the electricity supply with using lots of different uh, fuels and sources. So energy security in the 21st century is much more broader, much more wide and difficult to provide stable electricity supply without causing any kind of blackouts uh, to the consumers. So to think about this new type of energy security, what we should think about and what are the elements or what is the uh, difficult uncertainties which we have to face with. Let's see the slides little by little. There are plenty of uncertainty. One is, first one is this Asian uh, growth, because uh, energy demand happens where the economic growth happens. So China, India, or other uh, developing economies are just using the increase of the energy demand as such, while OECD, OECD countries are developed economies, uh, will just level off its uh, uh, energy demand toward 2035. So two thirds of the energy are in Asia. So in that means energy security issue is an issue for the growing Asian economies. What these Asian economies uh, should take care of this security issue jointly or separately or in a more conflictual manner or a more peaceful way. This is a very interesting issue for the global economy and community in the future. This oil demand basically comes from by using the car ownership, you, how, how you use a car. The passenger vehicle fleet doubles to 1.7 billion in 2035. And most of the growth certainly comes from China and India or Middle East, while developed economies, yes, grow, but uh, much less than the other uh, countries. And importation of the oil, petroleum, is certainly happening in the growing economy like China or India or ASEAN countries. You can clearly see toward 2035, the increase happened this countries, while the importation in the United States will decline dramatically relative to the Japan or European Union. This is, there are two reasons for this. One, the United States will be much more energy efficient due to the higher prices of oil in the future. And also, it is true that the so-called light, tight oil of the United States, which is the oil which is, which is produced the th in the same way as the gas or unconventional gas or shale gas, as you know, uh, in the future. So U.S. importation will decline even more than four or five million barrels per day from now to 2035. And China is already the largest energy consumer at this moment, but China will be the largest oil consumer in 2035, while largest importer of oil around 2020. And the U.S. declines means that the United States will no longer 
need to import from Middle East. U.S. can import from Canada or Venezuela, uh, Latin America, or maybe Africa, but U.S. will not need to any oil from Middle East. This is this has certainly implications for the geographic uh, geopolitical change in the region. Of course, US, U.S. will commit, of course, to the uh, peaceful uh, Middle East solution, but having not not having to import oil from Middle East may impact its uh, willingness uh, of committing or commitment to the Middle East. This has a very interesting uh, geopolitical uh, implication for the petroleum security in the future. Yes, the next uncertainty which we will face is oil market in the Middle East. What does this uh, Arab Spring mean or what will be the impact of Iranian sanction? This is the IEA's very interesting chart showing the break-even costs for operation or production of oil. That is shown by the blue part in the downside of the chart. The production cost is about 10, 20 uh, dollars per barrel of oil. But to break even the budget, or to balance the budget, the price of oil should be much, much higher. And to my surprise, even for Saudi Arabia, the oil must be more than $80, $90, or even around $100 a barrel is necessary. And as you may know that uh, Al Mr. Al Naimi, the Saudi oil minister, uh, saying that the Saudi needs about $100 per barrel oil now to balance the budget. And this comes from the impact of Arab Springs. The king of Saudi Arabia must uh, provide billions of dollars for the public uh, well being. So the price of oil cannot go down. And certainly, if the investment into the facilities or exploration drilling uh, may decline due to the uncertainties in the Middle East, the impact could be enormous. In the red wording uh, at the bottom of the slide, you can see that if the investment to the MENA, Middle East, North Africa region, would decline about a third, one third, compared to the level of uh, the likely scenario, then the output will fall about 3.4 million barrels per day by 2015, and the price will rise up to $150 per barrel. So this kind of scenario of uncertainty and its impact to the investment will make the oil you know, market much, much tighter. And there comes the short-term issue of the Iranian crisis. The Holmes Strait, uh, there are 17 million barrels per day of petroleum, about 20% of global demand uh, go through the Strait of Holmes, and al also the liquid natural gas. The Japan is importing 85% of oil through Holmes Strait and 20% of LNG. But the Japanese program is getting much more serious if no nuclear reactors are running when the crisis happens. Currently, there is only one reactor out of 54 is running because of the uh, tsunami and Fukushima disaster in the power plants. Japan is reviewing uh, the current energy policy, and one after another, the uh, nuclear reactors come into the regular checkup, and the government cannot make this reopen or restart again so far. 
government is trying very hard to reopen uh, some uh, plant at this moment. So hopefully these plants will start uh, running uh, in the near future, but still the public acceptance of the nuclear power is a very much uh, low and the seriousness of this uh, Iranian issue together with the non-nuclear power in Japan may force Japanese economy in a very much of the so-called death spiral. That is my really serious concern. If Iranian crisis happens or Israel's attack on Iran happens much earlier than what we are now thinking, then the Japanese uh, economy is uh, really in a bad shape. And this is the kind of uh, the uncertainty we have to live with in, in this uh, Japanese situation. Next chat uncertainty is then is the gas is the uh, solution for the security for supply uh, for the uh, power sector. Yes, to some extent, that is true. The golden age for natural gas is happening. Um, uh, the red uh, bar chart shows the unconventional gas from shale gas or coal bed methane. And certainly this is a very interesting phenomenon that uh, traditional or conventional gas was more or less occupied, monopolized by four countries, Russia, Iran, Qatar, in Algeria. But now the production of natural gas expands to the very many countries, United States, led by United States, the evolution of the shale gas, China, Canada, Australia, or India, or South Africa, or some European countries too. So this uh, diversity of the source will certainly uh, strengthen the security uh, implication of the natural gas for the future. In natural gas, as you know very well, that much less carbon intensive relative to coal. Of course, it's more than the renewables or more than the nuclear, but still in the midterm, natural gas may contribute to the sustainability as well as security. But there are some uh, condition because Certainly, natural gas is the likely solution for the middle term, but the demand for the gas happens dramatically and increased dramatically in a country like China. The Chinese uh, consumption at this moment is the same level as Germany, but eventually will be the same level as the European Union as a whole. So 20 times more gas that China will going to import. So this is, uh, certainly the gas is important, but when China is using much more than uh, we expect, so the gas market could be also tighter. And of course, shale gas has some uh, difficulty in environmental uh, contamination, etc. in the United States. So certainly the gas production could be cost more costlier in the future. Uncertainty number four, and in this juncture, the very important uh, player is Russia as an exporter of fossil fuel, and especially natural gas. And Russia exported much of the most of their uh, production of gas oil to the euro. Seventy percent or more are going to Europe, but. For, for Russian energy security, as a producer or supplier, how to diversify the customers is their energy security policy. So, and also the, the production uh, center moves away from Western Siberia to the Eastern Siberia, means that Russia should focus more to the East. And China certainly will be the major uh, player purchasing uh, gas, oil uh, from Russia. 
not yet uh, starting in a, 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 the gas importation to China because uh, they are negotiating the price level and still uh, that's not yet solved. But eventually uh, China will be the very big uh, importer of Russian gas. So how to uh, connect or how to use Russian gas or resources in the Asia. The Asia is a demand at an increased demand center. And how to connect Russia to these uh, uh, consumer countries as a, uh, as in, the, in Asia is certainly a very inter interesting and important key issue for the energy security. For Japan too. Japan needs to import uh, Russian gas uh, in the future, we are already importing oil, but uh, maybe gas by the LNG, or maybe by pipelines, or maybe producing electricity by gas, coal, nuclear, or hydro, and importing the energy from Russia through the grid, power grid line. Maybe another very important option for Japan to diversify the sources. Uncertainty number one, five, this is Fukushima, yes. Uh, after uh, the disaster in the last year uh, of the Fukushima power plant, how the uh, global uh, society is accommodating the nuclear power is another big, big uncertainty, especially for Japan. IEA has produced some other scenario, which is called low nuclear case. Uh, which means that OECD countries will not uh, replace uh, nuclear power by new plants, means zero uh, increase. Uh, and non-OECD countries will continue to increase, much, but much uh, less uh, speed as uh, compared to the likely scenario which uh, brings about uh, uh, the speed of the increase or, 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 or the level of the nuclear power would be almost the same as the current level in 2035, while if uh, in, in the regular or before Fukushima estimate is uh, about 70% increase. Uh, you can see in the slide that uh, uh, the share in the electricity generation, the nuclear share, will stay 13% in the new policy scenario. This is the likely scenario. While low nuclear case declines from 13% to 7%. But this is uh, to make sure uh, that this is a scenario or case, which means IEA is not saying this low nuclear case happens, but is showing the impact of the low nuclear usage. Because if we don't use nuclear, means we have to use all other uh, in, uh, energy sources, coal or gas or renewable. Uh, IEA does not think that oil will re replace nuclear in the longer term. In the short term, yes, Japan is importing uh, quite a big amount of oil for the power sector uh, by compensating the shortage of nuclear power. But in the longer term, oil is not a solution because it's very costly. So either coal, gas, or renewable. But this means the huge increase of these, uh, the demand relative to the so-called new policy scenario. We need about two uh, more Australian uh, steam coal we need two-thirds of the Russian gas exportation, and we need five times more of the current German uh, renewable energy uh, production if low nuclear case happens. means uh, the less security because we have to import more coal and gas. It is more expensive because we have to uh, import more as well as using more renewables. And also we have to uh, have more uh, CO2 emission 
0 0.9 gigaton or about 66% more CO2 emission happens in low nuclear case. So less uh, security, uh, very costly, and less sustainable in this low nuclear scenario means. Germany has decided to phase out uh, nuclear power uh, from now to 2022. To make this happen, Germany should use energy uh, conservation about 10% and then much more renewables and probably much more gas while using less coal because uh, to match the challenge of CO2 emission reduction, Germany in this case should import about 16 billion cubic meter of gas and this, if this comes from Russia, certainly uh, the importation reliance uh, dependence of Russia increase uh, and certainly it means uh, the gas price could rise and it has impact to the other European countries so the German decision can happen because one reason is their grid lines connect each other in the Europe the transmission lines of the electricity is, are connected very strongly and widely so this helped Germany to achieve this uh, reduction of the nuclear power. But it's costly. And renewable is getting very costly at this moment. And the uh, German uh, program of using uh, the more solar power in the future means more investment in grid lines. Uh, and uh, this means uh, much more cost for them. Lessons from Fukushima. I was uh, invited to the IEA ministerial meeting uh, last October. Many of the ministers told me that, uh, Mr. Tanaka, uh, we do, don't want to see Japan totally phasing out nuclear power. We just want Japan to continue the operation safely, or much more safely. And uh, we want Japan to share the lessons from the Fukushima to make global nuclear power much more safer. And I fully agree. And we are very much encouraged by these statements of many ministers. And uh, uh, the many uh, lessons which are now coming uh, with the private, public, uh, investigation uh, commissions and one of the very strong statements by the chair of the investigation committee, public committee, Mr. Hatamura, is that Fukushima accident was caused by human error and should have been avoided and I fully agree with this very strong statement. So uh, lots of things we have to prepare. We made a mistake of preparing enough for the case of uh, station blackout uh, or tsunami, etc. And also the severe accident management was not enough uh, prepared. So this is a very, very uh, sad uh, uh, disaster for Japan. But uh, we have to uh, improve our regulatory system uh, putting uh, these uh, experiences into the better uh, regulatory mechanisms or organizations, the training of staff, more security, safety, integration. So uh, international cooperation, um, we are very much appreciative of what uh, many countries have uh, provided and committed uh, for the uh, better management of nuclear and, and uh, cleaning up uh, or decommissioning of uh, the failed uh, reactors, but uh, we want to see clear, uh, clearer lessons uh, why the Fukushima Daiichi plant uh, was failed, while not others. There are plants which is much closer to the epicenter but avoided uh, the tragedy very uh, safely because they built the power plant much higher places, etc. And uh, so it's not always that uh, this uh, program happens uh, to the other plants, but why 
it happens to that Fukushima Daiichi plant must be clearly understood. Uncertainty number six is uh, well. It is very certain that we are going to use more renewable energy in the future, but can it be integrated into the electric power grid? This is another big challenge, which now uh, Germany is uh, facing. The Europe has a very strong power grid connecting each other. And because of this uh, great connection, interconnection, uh, Germany can phase out uh, nuclear power by, if necessary, importing the power from France generated by nuclear, or power from uh, Denmark, Norway generated by wind, or coal by in, in Poland or Czech. So this interconnection helps Germany to uh, move away uh, and uh, at the same time you uh, help using more renewable energy sources because renewable energy is very much of via, uh, variable sources means uh, changing from time to time so to absorb these uh, gaps uh, the backup uh, of uh, backup power plant is necessary and this interconnection and making bigger market helps to use variable energy sources. On the other hand, Japanese case is very much uh, behind because uh, you know that Japan has two uh, frequency zones. 150, another 160. So east and west, Japan has two markets, separate markets of the power sector. So IEA has been strongly warning about the risk of two countries in Japan. And unfortunately, our recommendation, our warning uh, turned to be true last year in March 11th when the tsunami hit uh, the power plants in Fukushima the Tokyo Electric City, Tokyo Electric Company came into the real problem of the shortage of the power and they are forced into the, the planned uh, blackout so we have to unify these frequencies into one. Uh, the cost is certainly the big too. We have to invest to the generators in the future. But unifying into one system is really necessary for the security reasons and also at, at the same time for sustainability reasons. Japan is introducing renewable energy by uh, incorporating feed-in tariff system, but to make this system happen, the interconnection between power companies, utilities, are really essential. The cost of uh, renewables are getting higher, of course. Uh, this shows that the uh, generation uh, share of renewables is much less than coal and gas, but uh, investment share is much higher, means that you need cost of generating uh, power at uh, renewable energy like hydro, wind, solar are much higher than coal and gas. Certainly gas is very much attractive way of uh, power generation for the future. Uh, we know that uh, in the United States, the replacement of old coal power plants now happening by the gas and using very cheap, uh, unconventional shale gas. And also, feed-in tariffs uh, is, uh, is the issue of the subsidy. The cost of renewable subsidy uh, is, uh, is getting higher and higher. It's currently about 66 billion US dollars. It will move up to 250 billion, four times more in the future. So this uh, certainly makes the cost of renewables higher and higher. This is a very interesting chart which shows the Japanese uh, problem. 
of using renewable energy. Because uh, to use variable uh, renewables, uh, there are certain uh, limitations or technical limitations or potentials of using these due to the flexibility of the system, due to the design of the power sector. While Denmark can use 63% of the power from variable renewables, Japan can only use 19 because uh, of the one reason is the much less interconnection in the country and also interconnection to the neighbors. The Denmark is very well connected to their, its neighbors, so they can use the high percentage of renewable by using the, a part of the larger market. While Japan, uh, interconnection in the country is very weak. And it's not connected internationally to the neighbors like Russia, right? Like uh, Korea or China or ASEAN countries. So our let's say potential of using renewables are much more limited than other countries. So this is our problem. Uh, we have to invest. Uh, we have to start feeding tariffs, but not only that. We have to think about interconnection to our neighbors, just like the European model. Uncertainty number seven, yes, climate change mitigation. Where are we going and uh, what does this mean to the energy security? Yes, in Durban there are certain progresses, but still for 50 ppm scenario, which is the um, sustainable scenario, in the uh, left upper part of the chart you can see three scenarios of the IEA. The current policy scenario is the business as usual scenario leading us to about 1,000 ppm of the CO2 emission means about 6 degrees Celsius increase of the atmospheric temperature to the end of the century. While new policy scenario is a more likely scenario um, which incorporate, incorporate the COP Copenhagen Accord, the COP15 uh, 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 Accord, which are committed by the countries. And if these measures are incorporated into the, the, the country's uh, sustainable sustainability policy, yes, uh, it's much better than business as usual, but still uh, this leads us to about 60, 650 ppm uh, of uh, CO2 and the atmospheric temperature still uh, moved toward 3.5 uh, degrees Celsius uh, trajectory and may not necessarily peak out the CO2 emission in the near future. The sustainable scenario is this 450 scenario, the green scenario, which is going down and about the halving the CO2 emission by 2050 and which leads us to the 2 degrees Celsius uh, atmospheric temperature increase. But as you notice in the bar chart, the orange part is in, uh, reduced in, in the uh, non-developed uh, or underdeveloped economy, non-OECD countries. So two-thirds of the reduction must happen in non-OECD. And what technology necessary is in the uh, right hand side. And it shows that um, energy efficiency should play a very important role. Renewables, nuclear, biofuels, CCS. So we need all of these technologies to really uh, make this 450 scenario a sustainable scenario that happens. Now nuclear is very difficult, probably, as I said. And CCS, carbon capturing and storage, means uh, separating uh, carbon and sequestration, I mean, storing it underground. This is uh, the, still the hope, but the pilot plant is not really working at this moment. Uh, there are about eight uh, pilot plants happening, so still delaying. It's simple. 
the cost of carbon capture and storage is uh, very difficult to uh, say uh, compensated by the uh, commercial uh, profit because it just cost. So without having very high carbon price or carbon tax, it could be very very difficult to push CCS project at this moment. So yes, if nuclear is uh, less available, then we need more CCS. But this is a very difficult choice for any government at this moment. And coal is certainly very abundant. Uh, and for the energy security purposes, coal is very uh, good uh, resources. But it's very CO2 intensive. So depending on the scenarios current and business as usual or likely scenario of 450, the coal market uh, is getting very different. And who can make a difference? It's China. China used lots of coal for generating uh, power in the past and will continue to do so in the business as usual. But new policies or sustainability policy uh, comes in, uh, the China's demand will be much less and even negative to achieve 450 scenario. But will China do that? Depending on the economic growth, depending on the resource availability, depending on the prices of other fuels, China's policy would be different. And to make China to use carbon capturing and storage with huge amount of cost is a very difficult uh, issue. So if uh, climate change negotiation uh, takes some uh, concrete impact to the CO2 mitigation, this should be the measures to enforce China to use CCS or giving some incentives for China to use CCS like uh, clean development mechanism, etc. So, well, clean development me mechanism is now uh, covering yeah. carbon capture storage, but not enough. So I am asked to be in a senior high-level panel for the CDM reform, and I'm very much delighted to see that uh, CCS given is going to be given a much more uh, stress and importance for the future of the climate change mitigation negotiation. Even with uh, uh, these uh, strong measures of some countries, uh, we are now uh, facing the serious problem because uh, six degrees Celsius trajectory should go down to three degrees Celsius tra uh, trajectory, but emission from existing infrastructure, which is shown in blue, is already uh, occupying about 80% uh, of the uh, possible uh, emission under 2C degree uh, trajectory. means that in, in the eventually very near future in 2015 or 2017, if uh, mitigation action delays, uh, all of these uh, emission uh, let's say, uh, space is going to be occupied or lock-in, so we call uh, technology lock-in happens. And this means that after 2017, to achieve 2C de uh, degrees uh, trajectory, all infrastructure of power, or buildings, or cars, autos, should be zero carbon. So this means very difficult thing. So the IEA has started saying that the door to two degrees Celsius is closing. Very unfortunate truth, but maybe we may focus more to the adaptation rather than mitigation in the climate change negotiation in the future. Let's conclude our, my presentation by showing some ideas for the energy security in the 21st century. As I said that Energy uh, mix, how to make diversify energy mix is the most important for the energy security. So we, I rank 
the very different countries by the self-sufficiency rates of different countries by renewables and fossil fuels, and then add nuclear power as a quasi self-sufficient energy source. And this chart clearly shows that the countries with less renewables and less fossil fuels complement the situation or security by using nuclear power. Uh, France, Belgium, Japan, Korea, it's obvious. These countries use nuclear power for securing the sources which they lack in the renewables and uh, fossil fuels. For Europe, this is very interesting. Uh, each European country has different portfolio, like Poland, lots of coal, uh, Sweden, a renewable plus nuclear, uh, or like uh, Germany, diversified to the three. Uh, Italy suffers with much uh, less self-sufficiency without nuclear. Uh, France, Belgium is more nuclear uh, dependent countries. But as a whole, 27 European Union countries, you can see the bar chart uh, second from the bottom, uh, that uh, their self-sufficiency rate is 50% and very well diversified sources of renewables, fossil fuels, and nuclear. So this means that Europe is uh, seeking security and sustainability by connecting their utility electricity market together, or pipelines, the gas with pipelines. By making one big uh, electricity market or energy market in Europe, uh, they try to solidify their position against supplier like Russia or using more renewable energy sources in the bigger energy market. So this European model of collective energy security is very interesting and we can learn uh, for Asia in the future. This is uh, the strategic uh, petroleum reserve, which IEA uh, is major mission since uh, Henry Kissinger built this organization. But the problem of IEA strategic uh, reserve measures is that the weight of 90 days of irrigation is declining, while uh, other countries' consumption, like China, India, or ASEAN, increase. So if uh, suppose these countries start 90 days stockpile, the weight or relative importance of IEA declines gradually while the share of these emerging economies increase. So without cooperating or coordinating with these countries, the IEA can no longer influence the oil market as much as we do and we did in the past. So as a executive director of the IEA in the past, my major mission was to engage China and India into the organization. It was not perfectly uh, successful, but the cooperation is happening. But at the same time, there's a risk, certainly, that uh, if uh, the Iranian crisis or whatever the disruption happens, we have to work much, much closer with the major consumers like China, India in the future. And do we have enough, uh, let's say, institutional infrastructure to make this cooperation happen? Yes, pipeline is another interesting area which we have to do more. This shows the Russian pipeline is very well connected to the West, while not to the East. China is not yet importing gas from Russia. And Japan is going to import gas by liquid natural gas. But pipeline is another very uh, interesting uh, way of connecting or incorporating two countries. And German decision in the, uh, 1982 
the Prime Minister Schmidt decided to build uh, gas pipelines with Russia and Europe, and that makes the bilateral or geopolitical relationship dramatically, and eventually ends, ended up by unification of the Germany. Japan is asking the return of the northern territories, but in vain so far. But by connecting Japan with the pipeline, gas pipeline with Russia, we may change this geopolitics between two countries for the future, just as Germany did some time ago. So, yes, gas pipeline is a very important security, economic measures, but it has a huge implication for the geopolitics of the Asia in the future. China is certainly trying very hard to secure the sources of oil and gas. For the gas, China recently made an agreement with Turkmenistan in importing gas by the pipeline beyond thousands of uh, miles. China has not yet imported gas from Russia, but it may happen soon. China has a pipeline with Myanmar already and uh, tried to import Myanmar gas or liquid natural gas from Middle East through this channel to the southern part of China. And lots of LNG facilities are already built and under construction in the coastal uh, China Sea, East China Sea as well as South, South China Sea. So sea laying for China, as you can see here, is a very crucial interest of China security. We can understand that China is very now active in the East China Sea as well as South China Sea, but uh, you, we can clearly understand why by seeing this chart. As I said before, the United States is no longer in the future to import oil from Middle East. Will the United States continue to commit the protection of the sea lanes in this region uh, of their own interest or not? Or do we depend on the sea lane protection by the Chinese Navy? This is a very interesting geopolitical question which we don't have the answer at this moment. But China is certainly the very fast growing uh, energy user and how to incorporate Chinese uh, into the energy security framework is the key issue for the future of the uh, Asian energy security. For the electricity supply, yes, uh, many countries, Middle East, North Africa, and Europe will be connected by the grid line high voltage direct currency lines. Um, Desertec project is an energy for peace, very visionary, but getting more realistic now, using more renewables of uh, North Africa into Europe. This connects two regions uh, for the future. Yes, ASEAN countries doing uh, their own plan of connecting each other by uh, uh, grid lines or pipelines. Yes, there are some ideas in Japan that uh, Asia super grid of connecting Japan with uh, Russia, Korea, uh, Mongolia, China, ASEAN, or even to India. So this kind of grid connection in Asia may uh, be a one part of the very important energy security framework for the future. Last uncertainty is the government policy. Uh, many governments change the energy policy, infrastructure policy very frequently, on off, on off. The nuclear power is a very often the case, unfortunately, and this uh, discourage 
the investment of, from the private sector. We have to have 39 trillion US dollars accumulating uh, investment from now to 2035. And about half of this investment must go to the electricity or power sector. So can somebody continue to invest this much if government policy changes? So this is, again, a very important uh, implication that the government should make sure that uh, certain incentives stay or certain policy stay to secure the needed investment for the energy infrastructure. The last slide, uh, I don't want to go too much, but energy security, one cannot enhance energy security by risking uh, someone else's. Uh, comprehensive e electricity supply security is the uh, 21st uh, century uh, security framework. So EU model of this collective energy security could be interesting and important for the growing Asia. Power grid connection, gas pipelines, efficiency measures, new technologies. So we have to mobilize all of these uh, issues or, 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 or items to make this security uh, framework happen in Asia. And certainly after Fukushima, Japan's role of uh, sharing lessons learned for the safer operation of the nuclear power is very important because we know that many of the Asian countries like China, <coughs> Korea, India, Russia are continuing to use uh, uh, nuclear power. So safer operation in these countries is certainly the global interest as well as uh, Japanese interest. And final point is that what are the new roles of the United States as an um, Asia-Pacific nation? An APEC uh, meeting, uh, summit meeting will be uh, taking place in Radio stock, the Russia. The Russia is a hosting country uh, this year. So, very interesting time uh, that APEC may take up the issue of energy security for Asia, incorporating all these different elements uh, into the possible future uh, direction. Uh, thank you very much for taking your time, um, uh, one hour of my speech, and I'm very happy to. Uh, answer any uh, questions uh, you have. Uh, Jonathan, I will return the floor uh, to you. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Tanaka. It was a very great presentation. Uh, we'll dive into the question and answer session since we don't have too much time. Uh, first, we have two questions about China's energy relations with other countries. Indira Nasulo, who is an MS candidate at New York University, asked, mm -hmm. What do you think about the role of China in building new nuclear power plants in developing countries in the future? Mm -hmm. And Andrew Ayers has a second question. Uh, he asks, what do you think about the future of Chinese energy imports and exports, specifically uh, Chinese imports from power generation in Southeast Asia? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yes, China certainly will be a major energy player or energy technologies in the future. Um, about um, one third of the nuclear power plant will be built in China, in the, I mean, compared to the global uh, demand. So uh, Chinese technologies, uh, uh, we hope that uh, they will uh, develop into the safer technology. And at this moment, China uh, stopped uh, building, I mean, giving the, the approval of the new power reactors and considering they're using much safer, or maybe bigger uh, options or the third plus uh, generation reactors for the future. So it's not that thing because we need to, to make sure that China is building the safer nuclear power plant. Uh, is China going to export uh, these uh, power plants? Yes, probably, but uh, more they are much busier of building nuclear power plants in the country rather than selling outside. 
but as a uh, other uh, uh, energy uh, let's say developing economies need more nuclear power and certainly uh, china is a possible uh, contender or competitor in the nuclear technology in the future uh, what is the energy export import of uh, uh, china from southeast asia it depends uh, on many things. Uh, uh, China can uh, develop or uh, uh, build enough of the power capacity within uh, China. Or at the same time, uh, that uh, Southeast Asia can develop or build uh, enough of the uh, capacity uh, in the region. So it depends on these elements which direction uh, of the trade of energy may happen in the future. But in the locality, yes, there are plenty of uh, possibilities that uh, Southeast Asian countries build uh, power plants in, the, uh, in their country and export to the part of uh, China. This kind of uh, regional uh, trade always happens depending on the regional situation. The Canada is exporting lots of power to the United States, but uh, not east-west, but to south-north-south. So this kind of regional uh, connection always happens uh, in, in the Asia too. So how can we uh, plan for the future is that uh, to, uh, how can uh, we make the best mix of the nuclear or renewables or gas a power plant in the region uh, to facilitate the, the very good economic development. Probably this is a time we have to plan together. Where demand comes, where the supply comes, uh, the energy security always uh, increase when the transparency happens. So we need to talk, we need to plan together uh, for the future of the uh, power supply. Thank you. Uh, we have another pair of questions about Japan's electrical grid. Uh, Aaron Gill asks, what are the barriers to integrating the electrical grid? Are technical issues or political issues preventing support for this investment? Okay. And uh, Miyoki Tayama asks, uh, what do you think is a realistic time frame for integrating the grid? And also, do you think it's realistic to achieve broader integration among Asian countries, as you okay. mentioned the plan in your presentation, yeah. and what are the obstacles for that? Mm -hmm. Very good question. Japan, I mean, this 60 50 fre uh, health frequency uh, issue uh, has been a kind of historical issue already. Um, and uh, we are told that uh, this historic uh, uh, situation cannot be really modified or improved as uh, uh, considered because it could incur a huge cost. Yes, that's true if we replace uh, the uh, generator all at once, it costs 10 trillion yen or 16 trillion yen and such. But if we change one after another, when the replacement happens to the old uh, generator, uh, by the dual uh, generator. Dual generator means the generator which can produce 50 hertz or 60 hertz uh, depending on the demand. It already exists in the middle of the east-west uh, border. Uh, the power company is, can produce uh, either of the frequency uh, by the generator. I mean, uh, this is a relatively small hydropower plant. So to uh, build uh, this dual generator into the fire power plant uh, uh, or nuclear power plant, it is probably a little more costly, but it's technically possible. So replacing, uh, in fact, the unification must go into the 60 hertz because the western generators are much more than the east so the cost is less if integrating the system into the 60 that the western uh, standard so replacing the eastern part of the generator one after another uh, by the dual uh, generators then in a eventually in a 10 years time 
this is a time when all generators in the east are dual. So at that moment, we can decide to move to the 60 and unify. So it takes years, but the decision must be now. Otherwise, this will never happen. And uh, certainly there are technical ideas of connecting uh, east-west uh, by high voltage direct currency uh, current uh, lines but uh, this idea has been promoted years but never happened uh, may it may happen but uh, if this idea is uh, just uh, trying to uh, continue for say uh, the current market system or nine um, regional monopoly system uh, by uh, connecting different uh, frequency zones. So if uh, Japanese government is really serious of uh, introducing renewable energy in the future by feeding cars, etc., much wider and profound interconnected electricity market is probably necessary. And if the Japanese government is serious to unify into the one system, uh, to use more renewables and to, to make this market into one and uh, much more secured and connecting even in the future to the other countries, uh, this is the direction we have to see happen. Of course, uh, this is a tough decision uh, the Japanese government should take. This is uh, more technical than, I mean, uh, than political, I think. But if we don't take this uh, opportunity that the uh, electricity market uh, reform is under discussion now, so and uh, usually uh, the utilities are reluctant to engage uh, this direction because uh, the current system of uh, regional monopoly is a very comfortable system for most of the uh, utilities. But uh, future, more decentralized system, more competition of generators, so this so-called reform of the utility market are called unbundling must happen to make uh, these competition or renewables uh, really getting into uh, the system. So yes, it's tough and difficult, but if we don't do it now, never. That is uh, my assessment. Great. I think we, I think we have time for one more question. Uh, Nate Aiden asks, or Nate Aiden notes that you spoke optimistically about desert tech and supergrid integration. Mm -hmm. But do you or the IEA see any role for small scale distributed generation in achieving the 450 parts per million scenario? Mm. Ah, yeah, well, the desert tech um, supergrid is, uh, is very challenging uh, and very costly. But uh, if uh, we have to use more renewables, uh, just as 450 scenario uh, prescribed, uh, definitely we need uh, this kind of uh, network because uh, yeah, you know the renewables uh, need uh, the huge, uh, big electricity market to stabilize or to average out this uh, uh, variability. Um, and uh, eventually, not uh, very soon, but not only the high uh, voltage technic uh, direct current lines, like superconductivity lines may come into our scope. And then uh, superconductivity is zero loss. And if it is connected around the globe, for example, some part of the globe is always sunshine. So with superconductivity electricity grid, this is still visionary, but this can solve the global uh, energy problem. So the, the direction is correct. How can we uh, invest into this kind of system? It's certainly the challenging uh, 
political or economic question. But IA's 450 scenario is looks optimistic, but it's very pessimistic in a way that uh, if this does not happen, the, uh, the two degrees Celsius is simply impossible. And how big uh, this investment means uh, to the global community. So it, uh, 450 scenario in the IA is a kind of uh, reality check of the seriousness of the uh, climate change uh, negotiators. So we'll see. I mean, uh, you know, these are the very important uh, options. Electrification is increasing much faster than the demand increase of energy. So how can we make this sustainable uh, electricity future is the key uh, challenge and issue for the security and sustainability of the energy system of the future. Technology is very, very important, uh, but uh, also the strong commitment of the government is necessary to make investment happen. As the last uh, slide shows you that the uh, most difficult uh, challenge or uncertainty is the government policy itself. Thank you. Uh, unfortunately, I think that's all the time we have for today. But I'd like to thank you again, uh, Mr. Tanaka, for your insightful presentation. And I'd like to thank all of our participants today and let you know that a recording of this webinar will be made available on the Yale Center for Environmental Law and Policy website. And also, the next installment of our series uh, will be with Mr. John Leitner of the Seoul National University Center for Energy and Environmental Law and Policy. And he will talk about the climate policy of South Korea. The title of that presentation is Korean Green Growth Policy as Paradigm Shift, Implications for Development, Sustainability, and International Environmental Law. That webinar will take place on April 26th. So thank you again, Mr. Tanaka, and we look forward to all of our participants today joining us again on that webinar and future installments of the series. That's right, and uh, you can see me with uh, Henry Kissinger. As uh, you know, you may know that, that he is the founding father of the IEA, International Energy Agency, in 1974, faced uh, with the threat of the oil producing countries embargo of oil to of the time of the countries. Uh, IEA was created to safeguard this uh, disruption of the oil supply by creating uh, a joint operation or joint release of strategic stockpile of oil. So IEA is the security or petroleum security body. And uh, we have used three times this uh, strategic stockpile release. Now, as you know, in the United States, there are a discussion about using it again uh, when the high prices of oil is coming because of the Iranian uh, situation. But uh, certainly, this issue of energy security or petroleum security is now getting much bigger because after the first and second oil shock, many countries are moving away from oil and uh, diversifying their sources into gas, coal, nuclear power, or renewable energy sources, or of course, much more efficiency, energy efficiency or conservation. So, in fact, energy security's focus should move a little away from petroleum. Still, petroleum is a very important source, but uh, into the gas, into the renewables, or into the electricity supply. We've used in lots of different uh, fuels and sources. So, energy security in the 21st century is much more broader, much more wide and difficult to provide stable electricity supply without causing any kind of blackouts uh, to the consumers. So to think about this new type of energy security, what we should think about and what are the elements or what is the uh, difficult uncertainties which we have to face with.
Let's see the slides, little by little. There are plenty of uncertainty. One is, first one is this Asian uh, growth, because uh, energy demand happens where the economic growth happens. So China, India, or other uh, developing economies are... Hello, everyone, and welcome to the eighth installment of the Yale Center for Environmental Law and Policy, Climate Change Solutions, Frontline Perspectives from Around the Globe webinar series. My name is Jonathan Smith, and I will be hosting the webinar today. The Center and our partners at World Resources Institute and the Environmental Defense Fund are very excited to welcome Mr. Nobuo Tanaka of the Institute of Energy Economics, Japan, for today's webinar. The Climate Change Solutions webinar series is designed to highlight climate policy developments in each of the 10 highest carbon emitting nations of the world. We hope that delving into the climate actions of each of these key nations will help share climate change solutions across the globe. Today, Mr. Tanaka will be focusing on the energy policy of Japan and Asia more broadly. Just a bit of logistics before we pass the microphone to Mr. Tanaka. Hopefully you can all hear me and have connected to the webinar by integrated VOIP under the communicate menu in your WebEx window. Uh, we are going to have a question and answer session in the last 10 or 15 minutes of the webinar. So please write down your questions into the chat panel on your right side of your screen during the presentation. We will compile them and ask them at the end. Feel free Thank you very much for inviting me to talk to all of you. As, um, as I was in introduced, uh, my career started with the uh, Japanese government, METI, Minister of Trade and Industry. But uh, I experienced lots of the foreign uh, assignment in Washington, Paris. So I'm very often called as foreigner in Japan. But uh, now, uh, much more than ever, that uh, we need a kind of foreign view about the Japanese uh, energy policy or security policy or sustainability policy because uh, really after tsunami and uh, Fukushima incidents, uh, we are now uh, reviewing our energy policy and global view is really imminent to be uh, input into the process. I use my uh, slides, which I often use in various places, and uh, certainly it touches upon the IEA's uh, document, International Energy Agency's document, uh, called the World Energy Outlook 2011, and uh, I try to give you some idea what uh, these uh, uh, findings mean for Japanese policy uh, making. I will start with the first to include your name, affiliation, and or location when asking your questions. Uh, we would also like to note that Mr. Tanaka will be streaming video during the presentation, and this video should be streaming in the panel at the right side of your webinar window right now. Now, to introduce our speaker, uh, Mr. Nobuo Tanaka is currently the Global Associate for Energy Security and Sustainability at the Institute of Energy Economics Japan a role he has occupied since September of 2011. From 2007 to 2011, he was Executive Director of the International Energy Agency. During his tenure, he was responsible for pioneering the concept of comprehensive energy security, while also expanding the agency's focus on climate change, renewable energy, and the transition to a low-carbon energy economy. Mr. Tanaka began his career in the Ministry of Economy, Trade, and Industry, in Tokyo, and has also served as Minister for Industry, Trade, and Energy at the Embassy of Japan in the United States, and is both Deputy Director and Director for Science, Technology, and Industry at the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development. So without further ado, here is Mr. Tanaka. Thank you, Jonathan. Uh, good morning, or good evening, or, or, or good afternoon. I don't know where you are, but uh, thank 